Hello to all, welcome to Watchers TV and of course I had to do a special report on the big massive news of the summer and this will be a pretty long report regarding Basel World and the spectacular pullout of the entire Swatch Group from the world's biggest watch fair and without joking I don't even know if we'll be able to use these terms in the near future and this saddens me because such an event is definitely needed but its mission has to change and evolve, remember, evolve or die. So what does it mean, what were the reasons and what can we say at this stage on the future of this centennial event, especially when placed in the perspective of some rather positive news mentioned only a few weeks ago uh, regarding next year's edition with uh, more interaction, more for the visitors, more experience, new layout. And at the end of this report I will also drop a few ideas, maybe a bit radical, but some food for thoughts in these pretty serious times and of course I would be more than happy to discuss this with you in the commenting section here on the YouTube or you can uh, send us your views through our website if you want to be a bit more confidential. And hopefully I will be able to summarize uh, your diverse uh, opinions in the next prime time. So let's go and start with the announcement itself as it naturally came as a real shock despite only representing this time very concretely the consequences of what was feared for uh, following some lousy decisions and behavior by the organizers and beyond over the years and I'm not talking let's say the last two three years but already from quite some time. So things could be very different if people listen, stop being so stubborn and impose a strategy that simply wasn't in tune with the evolution of things. So Mr. Nick Hayek Jr, head of the SWAT group and known for some rather bold statements over time, well he chose a very reputable Swiss newspaper to announce in the middle of summer when the watchmaking industry is almost at a standstill that he would be pulling all 18 brands of the SWAT group out of Basel. Breguet, Omega, Longines, Blancpain, Jacques Edro, Harry Winston, Certina, Glacute Original, Tissot, Mido and that's just to name a few of these big power names of the industry. So at first some, of, uh, some people thought that it was a way of leveraging what could be seen as a menace in order to get uh, better conditions from the organizers, kind of you know this Trump style of negotiations. But no, the pullout had seriously been acted and it was formally announced a day after the publication on the Sunday uh, of this interview which definitely ruined the weekend and or holidays of some top management guys at the organizers. So how did we get there? Well I've unfortunately been talking about it since quite some time now, uh, meaning years basically, but the ugly words that come to everyone's mouth are sadly arrogance and lack of vision. Baselworld belongs to a Swiss publicly traded company called MCH and you have a mix of private and public shareholders that, con uh, that controls it. So MCH's uh, main mission is to either possess or manage the walls of event related uh, uh, infrastructure just such as Baselworld and being this type of listed company implies that you need to seduce investors, your stock needs to be sexy and attract uh, by showing solid returns, dividends and perspectives. Something which by the way can also be said about most of the power groups of the industry and their impressive brand portfolio. I mean think of Richemont, LVMH, Kering and naturally uh, the SWOT group itself. So well MCH decided some 10 years ago that to offer such perspectives it needed a half a billion infrastructure in Basel which with uh, with which they will be able to develop their model based on unfortunately a bad assessment of what the industry needed, what consumers needed, what were the inevitable consequences of the digital age, evolution of retail and so on. So basically MCH uh, thought that by simply selling, renting fancier square meters it would be uh, enough simply applying old rules would do the job and to amortize these huge investments well they thought we just have to increase our prices and people would simply be so happy and gracious. Brands all had to construct new booths costing them millions and millions and most of them build fortress type booths. They didn't really want to have the public wander too much around them and they were mainly there to meet their retailers and also meet the press but for visitors seriously it was already questionable if one could find any type of satisfaction of attending the show. If you wanted to see and touch watches well kind of a paradox but this was not the place to go which nevertheless cost 60 Swiss francs to get in so that's approximately 60 dollars. 
See the point. So the watchmaking industry being often a bit late when it comes to embracing the future, well that's kind of a tradition I would say, well neither brands or these organizers really understood the structural change that the digital age was about to play on them when it comes to uh, communication and marketing, but also and very importantly on the distribution and retail side of the business. So all these elements were not really uh, taken too seriously into consideration at the time uh, of these investments illustrating this lack of vision I was mentioning before. But unfortunately it goes much further than that and was very perceivable this year. I heard so many people being fed up of having this very unpleasant feeling of being uh, squeezed uh, not only by the event itself with its unreasonable fees but also by all these side expenses that are just ridiculous and when greed becomes just too apparent and leaves this slight uh, bitter taste and a long-lasting one well things become complicated and this despite despite the fact that at the end of the day I thought it was a pretty cool addition. On our side we had a great experience with our own booth, uh, we met a lot of enthusiastic people wandering around the atelier for instance uh, and uh, business was okay for most of the brands even though I doubt that the show had anything to do with it. But one has to remember that the number of exhibitors has gone down dramatically over the last few years. From 2500 some 5-6 years ago to 1300 uh, 2 years ago and a drastic cut this year to 650 approximately. So indicators were already alarming. So at the end of this 2018 edition and after some uh, last minute negotiation almost all remaining brands finally confirmed their present for 2019 but practically none committed beyond this. But this didn't prevent Nick Hayek of brutally pulling the plug now and this will have massive consequences. So first of all the Swatch Group is like a village within the, within the show. It represents thousands of square meters and it's at the very center of the main hall one. This year and as part of these negotiations to reduce cost, brands didn't have to dismantle their booth, proving again that I mean, these gigantic halls were built exclusively for this kind of more or less 10 day event. So yes, uh, crazy and really disproportionate. Well to take out the entire infrastructure of the Swatch Group brands will be a total nightmare. I've often been within these walls a few days or even a few weeks before the actual show and when you see the logistics of how these booths are installed I can seriously say that I have no, no idea how the heck they will be able to do this and uh, once it's out well this will leave a massive void. What will happen? How will they fill it up? Will the atelier just announce on the other side of this whole one uh, where the Movada group uh, used to be before also quitting some uh, the show a couple of years ago? Well will the atelier move closer to the other big players still there? Rolex, Patek, Tag, uh, Tudor, Chopin etc. Will Breitling seize the occasion of getting much closer too? Will Tudor expand its presence and get a bit out of the shadow of Rolex? Will some other brands found uh, just above uh, move down? Thinking in particular of Japanese brands such as uh, Seiko and Citizen, huge world players that deserve better reconnaissance. Will other brands that quitted before join back in? Will they even want to consider this with all this negativity currently associated with the event? And if they left, well it was for a reason. So you see the nightmare I'm talking about and what is sad is that I very sincerely think that the recently announced direction where Basel is heading seems like a good one. Most probably a bit late but at least it reacted and the input of the new CEO and his team is indeed constructive. But this pull out cast some very serious shadow on the very existence of the show and this new management team have an immense task ahead of them to rebuild some trust towards some very hesitating brands in the actual sustainability of the event. Event. We're beyond damage control here. Anyhow, I've already shared my opinion about the pertinence of such events and you know that I feel pretty negative about it. If you look at it with a simple short-term vision, meaning if we are only talking numbers and returns in today's context. Uh, to make it short, retailers are no longer purchasing their stock once per year during such events and brands don't have and shouldn't reveal all their yearly novelties at once but instead you know, spread them out throughout the year. So therefore I totally get that uh, the over overall participation cost for the Swatch Group, meaning floor rental, uh, hospitality, accommodation, etc. estimated to be around 50 million US dollars 
becomes very questionable. Even for a group like Swatch, this doesn't represent a super tiny portion of its marketing budget. It's definitely not a negligible expense. So to spend less or differently means something important, whether to the industry itself, meaning for instance to the retailers, as we heard that the Swatch Group intends to reduce by three the number of worldwide retailers to around 1,500 in the next few years, but also to the actual shareholders of the group itself by saying we regain control. So for instance, there were serious rumors that the top brands of the Swatch pyramid would be out and this made some kind of sense. We know that many super high-end brands are internalizing their retail business, internalizing their margin with their own motor brand boutiques, and this goes beyond the, the, the Swatch Group naturally. So when you sell more or less 100% of your production to your own boutiques, how do you justify the cost mentioned before? Well, you get the picture. So it's a strong and bold message that Mr. Hayek is sending out. And when I said uh, spending differently, well, the Swatch Group uh, will still have to cater some kind of event with more or less the same mission as Basel, as it nevertheless still relies on a strong network of retailers for brands such as Longines, Omega and Tissot. And it would still cost them quite a chunk of money to organize this, maybe even more in the first run. So basically, and for me, this is the key point in Mr. Hayek's decision, as he simply said, enough is enough at Basel. Had you cut the bill by two or made some other arrangements, uh, well, maybe it would have uh, changed things, but then it would, uh, it would need to be applied uh, uh, for all the other exhibiting brands. And there you get that uh, for the organizers and this MCH group, things would be problematic considering the investments made. So a nice catch-22 situation, but the very fact of not looking reality in the face and accepting that their model was wrong totally prevented them of giving some leeway and adapting their pricing strategy, for instance. It's as if uh, they knew they were going to hit the wall and were still accelerating full on. It's like this other example when they were officially saying during the last edition that the reduction of exhibitors had been a deliberate objective set by them to increase the quality of the event. How in the world can you take people for such fools? I mean, come on. Well, the overall result is a very, very complicated situation and is now costing Basel World dearly their parent company, but also the entire ecosystem of Basel, its hotels, restaurants, taxi, the state and whatnot, without mentioning their reputation and egos. It's a massive image blow. I am tempted to think that this is probably something quite satisfying for Mr. Hayek and probably many other big bosses of the industry are quietly saying to themselves, he had the guts to put it off, chapeau. But at the end of the day, and this is where this entire story saddens me, is that the watchmaking industry needs such an event. And it goes back to what I was saying before. You can't look at uh, such events only with a direct uh, ROI indicator. There's many more uh, other important dimensions that these events need to address. And again, the new management team of Basel was, I hope, or still is going in the right direction. I was super happy to be part of it this year. Uh, and I thank the organizers, uh, organizers for pulling this. But I can really imagine that there must be some serious misbelief and interrogation right now at the organizer's HQ. So let's now think and talk a little bit outside the box and throw a few ideas out there. So you guys know that I'm a very strong believer in the notion of experience, sharing experiences and emotions, building closer ties between the consumer, the watch lover and the watchmaker himself. And these events should definitely address this as one of their priority mission. Making business is of course super important, but the fact of doing what it takes and contribute in keeping watchmaking something cool and interesting is vital in a long-term investment to the benefit of all. So in Dreamland, what kind of solution can we envision? And it's not because things have been done in a certain way for tens and tens of years that some kind of disruptive uh, mindset shouldn't be considered. So historically, Basel World and the SI Change were set at the same time in spring. Uh, people could go from one to the other. But because of the Geneva Auto Show that was uh, also occurring around these uh, same dates, the SIH had difficulty to impose dates that would suit both events. So main reason why uh, they decided that it would now take place in the mid-January, a date which, uh, by the way, suits better the commercial agenda of many people. So here again, the Basel World people didn't want to take this uh, into consideration at the time, showed a bit of arrogance instead of finding clever solutions to the benefit of everyone. So one of the ideas would be for Basel to coincide back again with the SIH. 
But let's push this uh, much further and if the event is to get smaller, why not scrap Basel as a location? I mean, MCH, the event parent company and promoter of Basel World, also have in their location portfolio uh, some pretty big holes in Lausanne. That's 60 kilometers from Geneva. So why not move the entire show with a new concept in Lausanne? People, retailers, visitors, uh, I mean, the press could easily hop from one destination to the other, even on the same day. The SI change reduced its opening days uh, for the next edition to only four, but now would make sense to extend it again, align it, uh, align it to this new Basel or uh, Lausanne world, have the weekend open to the public for the SI change if it still wants to remain confined to some happy few people uh, uh, on the, the rest of the days. But well, there are clearly solutions if people started to talk to each other, drop their egos and pull. Uh, what seems as practical and maybe obvious synergies. Well, I'm totally open to share some ideas, not sure the right people listen, unfortunately, but I really think now is the time to drop some unnecessary and passe conviction and look for a brighter future in tune with what we all want, a strong and respectful and respected watchmaking industry. So well, anyhow, that's how I see things and you guys know my enthusiasm, so please don't hesitate to share your views and ideas. Uh, on the matter. Uh, you, you represent the real power, the ones that will or won't contribute in the idea that watchmaking is still cool and needed. So brands can do what, uh, whatever they want, but if you, the consumer and advocate, don't really appreciate it anymore, well, goodbye watchmaking as a whole, unfortunately. So let's have our voices heard a bit, at least Kissed a bit and viva watchmaking, of course. So this is it uh, for this report, or should I say plea? I know it was a bit long, but there was a lot uh, I wanted to say and share. I really hope for the best, uh, and the next few weeks are going to be pretty exciting and interesting and impactful, kind of a pivotal moment if uh, uh, the many actors of the industry seize this opportunity to address some serious and long-term issues. We could be in for some other surprises, and now I will shut up, take my breath, have a drink, cross my fingers, and thanks for watching. Thanks again to our patrons uh, that understand what we're trying to do here on The Watchers TV. And you can't imagine how appreciative I am, how we all are, and see you real soon for some more action. All the super best to you. See you.